I'm going to respond to a video by Amon John X called Some Flaws in Atheism. I will summarize his main points and then respond to them. Uh, I have included a link down below so that you might be able to watch this video to get the full context of the discussion and to make sure that my main points are not bogus, or the main points I summarized are not bogus. His first point is that atheism argues that because there is no specific Christian God, that there are no other possible gods. This is a mistaken belief that he is holding. Or, or that he is sharing, or rather, or telling us that atheists have. It comes from the fact that many apologetic arguments tend to be just arguments for the very basic general concept of God. Uh, for instance, the Kalam cosmological argument. A uh, common criticism that, atheism, uh, that atheists lay against that is that uh, even if we were to grant you the argument, uh, despite all of its logical flaws, even if we were to grant you this argument, it doesn't prove that the Christian God exists. It just proves that the basic, most limited version of God exists. And this leads directly into your second point, uh, which is to say that in order to say that God doesn't exist, one must define God, which means it exists. Well, uh, I can give you a definition for God, because you seemed rather confused. I, I will look it up in the dictionary and choose the most relevant for the philosophical discussion at hand. Um, but that doesn't mean it exists. Because you can define things that don't exist in objective reality that just exist within your mind, which is subjective reality, which is unverifiable, untestable, and unconfirmable. Whereas objective reality, we can do that. We have set up processes that we can test, observe, and verify the information we learn through it. So we can have a definition for something that exists within subjective reality, but not within objective reality. And when we're talking about existence, really, we shouldn't even use exist within subjective reality because of the definition of existence. But first, let's go over the definition of God real quick. Um, the most relevant definition here is a superhuman being or spirit worshipped as having power over nature or human fortunes. Now, if it doesn't meet this definition, then it's not a god. I'm sorry, but that's how language works. You don't just get to define God in whatever way you see fit because you're arguing for its existence. If you are arguing for something different than that, then you're not arguing for God. You must change your vocabulary because it would be on par of me arguing for the existence of plastic cups. You don't just get to change language around as you see fit merely because there's some confusion. Now. There are many flaws within this basic definition, which is where um, your previous point tends to fall apart, is that we're criticizing the basic definition of God. Uh, you know, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about just because an argument a Christian uses fails that there are no gods. It's that his argument was representational of this basic idea of God, and it fell apart. And the very basic definition is flawed. I have included a link in the description box below to a video by YouTuber ProfMTH, who is one of the most popular uh, YouTube atheists here, uh, where he talks about it, admittedly in the specific case of Christianity, but if you uh, think about it a little bit and really digest the information, you can see how a lot of what he's saying can be applied to the very basic definition of it, with relational attributes, secondary characteristics, things like this. Uh, he'll do a very great job explaining that. Your third point is that atheism is the belief that there are no gods. And then you follow that immediately in the next sentence that saying atheism says that there any possible conceptions of gods don't exist. Now, the problem here is that saying that any possible conception of gods is not the same thing as saying that the belief that there are no gods. What you're doing is making it more specific. Um, because of the open-mindedness of the philosophical approach to atheists, who you have to criticize, the philosophical atheists, not the stupid internet atheists who don't know what they're talking about. You have to find people who actually espouse the philosophy if you're trying to find flaws in the philosophy, or else you're finding flaws in a movement or particular people. You're not finding flaws in actual philosophy, which I, is your stated objective. Now, um... Because of this, and because of, uh, because of this, the, the philosophical atheists tend to all have beliefs in open minds. Because of this, that the, i uh, sorry I keep repeating that, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a moment. Um, because many atheists, uh, especially the philosophical variety, advocate having an open mind, the implication that should be made here 
uh, based on context clues rather than one's own bias, which is what your implication was, is that all presented concepts of God thus far are illogical and don't make any sense and don't exist. Um, and I promise I'll get back to the definition of existence. I have, it's, it's, it's better saved for later, uh, after you've made a couple more points along the same vein. So I apologize for mentioning that. That just came back to my mind, and I apologize for the kind of stream of consciousness thing. I'll try and speed it up a little bit. So uh, your implication is wrong there and based on your own bias rather than actual context clues of studying atheism. Now your next point I want to criticize really isn't a point, it's more of just an analogy you use that's incredibly flawed. Atheism is a belief about a very broad concept that I've already defined for you, but your analogy focuses on a very specific event, 9-11, and conspiracies for it. Your analogy would make more sense if you were trying to make an analogy about the basic concept and definition of conspiracy, uh, and arguing about the existence of conspiracies, not which conspiracies are true. Because uh, that's not what it's about. Atheism is not picking and choosing between the religions. It's about attacking these basic definitions. That's the best, that is the most direct route to proving the non-existence of any other deity, is to prove that the very basic foundation of it is flawed and illogical and makes no sense. So, let's continue. Um, I'm going to have to use some more definitions here because it's something that you apparently lack as dictionaries and the ability to search the terms you use. Uh, your next point is, prophets and religious leaders, unlike 70 to 80 percent of humans, can think abstractly, and religion is just them sharing their abstract thoughts in concrete ways. The problem with this is that abstract thought is kind of what defines humanity. Uh, abstract thought is literally the thing that separates humanity from the rest of our existence. And that's because, uh, and I will be quoting Wikipedia here, in philosophical terminology, abstraction is the thought process wherein ideas are distanced from objects. It is our ability to perceive the world outside of our immediate surroundings that leads to our ability to think abstractly and thus with reason. Any reasonable thought, any, any logical kind of argument is an expression of abstract thought, and thus most humans are capable of it. But any, on an even more broad level, if you actually think about that definition, you'd realize that if you just thought about what you had for breakfast this morning, that's an abstract thought, because you were distanced by breakfast both in time and space. You're not eating breakfast at the moment. You're not actually with your breakfast in its original state, you know, nutrients are broken down and stuff, but you're not with it. So let's think of breakfast, you know, months, years ago. To separate it in time even more, and you're separated in time. You're not there. You're not actually observing the event happening. There are no actual objects you're observing. You're just thinking about them. That's abstract thought. So you've inadvertently called 70 to 80 percent of humans not human by this, and it's kind of disgusting that and this points out why you should know your terms, because you end up arguing incredibly horrible things when you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Next couple of points I hope to go through fairly quickly. Something outside of the earth put it here. That is not good language if you're going to be using philosophy. You should use objective language with philosophy, things that can be verified and agreed upon. Because what you're doing there is implying that someone or something put it there, that there was an action that was carried out by some form of consciousness or an entity. That is what is implied in that. Whereas if you just said formed, that is more scientific, that is more objective. And while you might disagree with a naturalistic, with a naturalistic approach to things, we have to use objective language. You can't use language that has that incredible bias to it. We have to use language that we can verify has some truth value. So you can't just, and that, that's part of definitions. Objective reality goes beyond just naturalism and stuff. That's how language works. That's how definitions work. And so, uh, you should use objective language rather than biased language. Now, something outside of the universe put it here. This is when I feel like looking up the definition of existence. Because there cannot be something that exists outside of the universe with which to take actions. Especially when you consider how time and space are interwoven and part of the same thing. Uh, which I'll bring up in a bit, you know, because time can't also exist out the universe. So, the basic, the definition of existence, according to the dictionary, is the fact or state of living or having objective reality. And I apologize for reading that kind of weirdly. My mouth's getting a little dry and I don't have anything to drink. Um, 
because of this, and and and, and we are uh, our 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 understanding of objective reality is limited to what our perceptions are capable of, and you admit to this in the video that our perceptions are limited to the dimensions we're capable of perceiving, um, despite the fact that we have evidence that there might be more dimensions. However, nothing can exist outside of the universe for this very reason. If we cannot observe it, if we cannot extrapolate from the current data, at the very least, to get some kind of idea based in actual observations, then we cannot have objective knowledge of it. We cannot perceive it. And if it can't be entered into our objective reality, then it cannot possibly exist according to the definition of existence. Objective doesn't mean absolute. Objective means what is verifiable and observable and testable to us. And that's what existence is. If we can't perceive it, it doesn't exist. That's language. That's not an argument. That's not philosophy. That is the English language speaking. And if you argue, you need to argue something differently. You need to use different words if you're trying to make these points. You need to come up with a new way of saying it, because this way is simply nonsensical. Now, your next point is the Earth and universe had to be created. This is another one of those you should really, really, really use objective language. Even more so on this one than put it here. Because of the common argument, and I can almost cite it exactly like what Ray Comfort is famous for saying, um... Creation is 100% verifiable proof that there is a creator. This is a very common thing, and by context clues, that's what's left to be assumed when you say this. That is the implication that is made because of the heavy context clues. You have to understand the words you're fucking using before you use them, please. Use a dictionary. Understand that, you know, you should remove your bias as much as you can to try and act as reasonably if what you're trying to do is philosophy which is all expressions of reason. That's how it works. So it's always worked. Now, your final point is we cannot fathom what happened before time or after time because our perceptions are limited. You're actually kind of right, but it's also nonsensical at the same time. It's kind of the obvious, it's, it's, it's an obvious fact. And we cannot fathom what happened before time because the very concept of something happening before time is nonsensical on multiple levels. You cannot have something happening before time exists, because in order for something to happen before something, there needs to be time with which to relate it to. I can't say something happened before 641 if there's no time. If there's no time, I can't say something happened before something. How is it so fucking hard to understand? You can't say that something happened after time either, because if there's no time, after has no meaning. And even more basic than both of those is you can't have something happening without time, because happening means there's an action taking place, and actions must take place over time. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an action. It'd be a lack of action. There'd be no action. And without time with, for something to happen in, you cannot have something happening. The question makes absolutely no sense. Everything you've said in the video makes no sense. I really suggest that if you're here to do philosophy and you're here to talk to us and disprove our philosophies, that you actually participate in it and actually elevate yourself to the level of knowing something about what you're saying. Because what you've done here is not offer any actual criticisms of atheism. The only thing you've done here is not only disprove yourself on several points, but shown yourself to be an arrogant jackass who has no idea what the fuck he's talking about. And on that note, I'd like to say a little note to people who've seen my videos before. And I'd just like to explain a little bit about my shifting tone, because I've been criticized for it before. When it comes to philosophy, I will sit here and be more calm and less harsh. You know, definitely aggressive, but less like I was yesterday with Mr. Flip the Coin. Um, and that's because it's philosophy. It demands a certain level of etiquette and... Uh, a certain level of uh, reasonableness, you know, of, you know, not just flat out insulting people, I believe at least. This is how I prefer to approach philosophy. When it comes to current events, however, it can go either way. It depends on if I feel like ranting against some idi idiocy, I guess, or idiots, I should have said. Um, or if I feel like, you know, actually laying out a uh, some sort of reasoned case against something. But then I would consider that to be political philosophy. So I would approach it that way. 
it, it really depends on, on what my goal is uh, for the video. You know, I'm not always out there to have intelligent conversations with everybody because sometimes people are just hilariously stupid and you got to make fun of them. Um, and I want to have a little fun here on YouTube. So I just felt I'd explain that why I'm not super harsh with this guy even though uh, everything he said was stupid as shit. Now, enjoy whatever the fuck you're about to do other than watch this video.